well that allows that we can use it you know yeah oh i but see yeah. it from uh um you said it was jeff correct his name was jeff grandfather thomas h duke yeah of charlottesville yeah. and and for me i'm gonna put my teacher hat on <laughs> i would do a timeline and this is for jeff and regarding Thomas H. Duke, I would put, do a timeline on him. Mm -hmm. And I can share that form if I didn't already share it with um, Miranda and JMRL. I have one that I make up that I use, that I teach from and use, mm -hmm. and use myself. And um, that's what I would do, because I would chronologically clock and i think it's the best thing to do with any mm -hmm. brick walls is to chronologically tap into everywhere they're at where their name comes up in order mm -hmm. and try to follow where they're at it's really good um with women also mm -hmm. because there was another one that we had that talked about a different name on the death certificate versus the name that you know when she was married that they knew of and possibly mm -hmm. the maiden name of course was different and again i think there's just another marriage in there <laughs> and and again the timeline is probably the best tool to use and um i don't know did i share that with you at all you shared it the last session but you didn't send it to me to send out to participants oh okay but well, that's not good. <laughs> well, it is a little bit after seven, so shall we get started? Yes. All right. Um, so welcome everybody. This is the second um, Ask a Genealogist session that we're having. Um, the next one's gonna be in December, December 10th, 9th, December 9th, I believe. <laughs> I'm, <gonna look> <laughs> well, I'm thinking of it, let me look at the calendar. That's what I'm doing, December the 9th. <laughs> Yes, at seven. December 9th, Wednesday, December 9th, again at seven o'clock. Um, I'm Miranda Burnett. I'm the historical collections librarian with the Jefferson Madison Regional Library. And I also manage the collections over at the Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society. And joining me this evening, some of you may already know, Shelly Murphy, who is the, um, the descendant project researcher for UVA. And um, one thing we want to say with this webinar so even though we have it as a webinar format um, as opposed to all of our individual faces being uh, right. in its own box um, we know that you in the audience also have genealogical experience and so if you know of any other sources um, any research tips that you have or strategies that you found helpful in your own research you can post those in the chat um, I would recommend there's the bottom um, the bottom box right before you post. Make sure you have checked all panelists and attendees so that way everyone can see um, what your question or your comment is. Um, and next, there's also the question and answer box at the very bottom. So you're welcome to use that too if you have questions. So, um, Shelly, why don't we get started? Because I see Karen is in the audience. So why don't we get started with Karen Anderson's question? And that one came in, was uh, sent to you yesterday. Okay, I want to make sure, because I think I pulled two down, not three. So I, you, would you like to read that one? I only pulled down two. So oh, there's okay. one probably still in my email box. All right, so Karen says, I've hit a brick wall with researching the origins of my great-grandfather. Um, he was a milk truck driver in Brooklyn, New York, and that she has found lots of information in the U.S. Census about him. Um, she has his marriage certificate from 1872 and says that he wrote that his parents were Johann Fall and Johanna Christian. And he, she says, that's a brick wall, is that um, it says he was born in, I guess it's Jarman Dimen, Pom Pomerania. Um, but she has looked everything she can try for a Johann Fall in Pomerania and cannot find anything. 
if she is stuck, and I'm gonna put in the chat um, the ancestor's name and where he's from as well. Okay, good, yeah, I'd like to see yes. the name. I know my, my the pronunciation is not the best. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna ask, is Jarman J-A-R-M-E-N-A-N or O-N? Yep, let me get this. Uh, in the box here and Karen if you're listening one of the things I would think about is uh, Johan sometimes comes up as John my one of my patriots for the um, American Revolution was Johans with the two ends in the ES and um, a lot of the records come out with John and so DAR actually changed my certificate to John from Johan, which they also just called him Hans. So also remember that the names could have different variations on different records, but if you can pinpoint time and place that it's probably still your ancestor. And then Pomeranium, one thing, uh, first resource I think of anything across the ponds would be the Family Search Wiki. And they have, um, you know, all of it's worldwide. And I don't know, you want me to pull I was gonna it say, up? Do you want to share your go screen? Um, yeah, I can go get it. Hold on. Okay. And Karen said, I only see hoes. We're the only ones oh, here. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Just <laughs> us. <laughs> All right, hold on. But um, same thing that I was mentioning. Oh, it's making me sign in and everything. What did I do? Okay, let me. And am I able to share my screen? Oh. Let's see. There we go. Yep. Does that work? Okay. Yep. You got me as co host. So, as we were talking for a few of you that were, you know, here when. Um, before we started, I was talking about timelines. For me, and again, I, I said I put my teacher hat on. Um, I teach at a genealogy institute. One of the biggest things is being able to put things in a timeline. And so chronological order, if you're trying to track someone, and again, with Johan, Jarman, you know, the different spellings or soundings of his name, I would also put him in a timeline and track his whereabouts. So I went to, I'm on familysearch.org, which is a free site, always free. And you, of course, can access it for 24, you know, 24 seven. It is the Church of the Latter day Saint site. So go pick your country and get to the wiki and let me see if I can all right I lose give me the spelling because I lose the chat box when my screen is up the country it is yep p-o-m-e-r is that German empire because it pops up yep it is got it okay so this is the wiki that says everything that um FamilySearch.org has, and again, headquarters are in Salt Lake City, but they are worldwide, and there could possibly be family history centers also in these countries, in which you just scroll down, and one of the big things is you're going to have, if you don't speak German and, you know, understand the history of this country and things like that, because look at here, it looks like there was a split back there. Um, I would see if there is, and that's what I'm looking for. Here's the counties of Pomerania. And here's history. And it goes on, and there's links. But what I was looking for is to find out if there was a family history center there. Because I would um, establish contact with that, with that center, if you can and uh, find the name of your ancestors and family history records, German finding, and start looking through each of these little sites and find out if anybody has any blogs out 
that also researches the same country and um, ask you know questions and and go for that. Let me see. I'm still not seeing if they're. Oh, they've got parishes too. Interesting. I know Albemarle has parishes, so I always find that interesting because I think of parishes always around French, you know, Louisiana and the parishes. Um, so yeah, and here's some more tools and records and things. And we've got handouts here. Legacy Family Tree Webinars is another place to find out about German research. And um, let me type that in, let's see. Family Tree Webinars, Family Tree Webinars. Now this is a membership group, best 50 bucks a year I've ever paid. And I'm not signed in, so you're gonna see what's free here. But what this is, um, and my heritage actually owns it. Jeff Mas uh, Rasmussen is the, um, I guess, like the manager of the site and everything. But here's an example. You can type in Germany and what's in the library. $49 a year, you have 24 hour access and go in and get a little more educated on researching German records. And then you're also getting contact with these speakers that are experts in German records for getting some more leads. So I think this site is also another one um, that would be helpful for you. And um, now he's a, I'm familiar with him speaking a lot. But anyway, and look, there's a Trace Your German Roots online, there's a book. So lots of resources here that should be able to help you find Mr. Johan. I don't know if she's got any other questions because I don't see them. And let me see if I clicked on one, if it had come up. And I've only been, you know, when I'm signed in. Now, the first seven days, well, there's the presentation. You can watch a preview. Other than that, I log in and I get the syllabus. But again, and again, I don't have any affiliation per se with them. I actually have a talk on African American genealogy challenges on this site. But again, I get paid for my own work, so I'm disclosing there's no affiliation. But again, it's the best forty nine dollars a year investment that I've had, and um, because the library is unbelievable. Or you can look for specific speakers and also find um, you know, their topics as well. And I think they have a little store and stuff too. So, okay, anything else on that? Did she have a, another question? It looks like that was it. Ideas um, for getting past that wall of finding her great-great-grandfather, um, her, her great-great-grandfather. Yeah, but I think those, the, the wiki and, you know, the invest in the money and a timeline also, I think will help because that will work. It doesn't matter what country. It's just getting things in order to follow, even if there's migrations, marriages, births and things. And I'll see if I can pull up a blank timeline while you go on to the next one. And share that with you. Uh, that's to say, um, Lenora has posted the um, the link in the chat to the Statue of Liberty and the passenger ship list. Awesome. I know times that I've looked at ships lists, um, those have been very helpful to give uh, places of origin. Um, researching my spouse's Polish side of the family, um, usually giving where they're coming from or where they're born and so forth. Um, so that could be another good resource to look yeah. at find um, an immigration record. Okay, I'm going to share this right quick. Uh, and let's see if I can get it shrunk down a bit. Okay. Looks like this is one that I use in uh, training stuff. But anyway, oh, where'd it go? The beef right back up. 
Okay, so uh, trying to get it where you guys can read it. So I start off the timelines. I always set a goal. What am I specifically looking for? And it's not a goal that says I want to know everything about the Murphys. No, it's specific and, and like the one question about, I want to know X about my great grandfather or great grandmother, whatever the question is. And so I've got the date and then I got the event, which I've changed this and updated it because the event right now would be birth, marriage, death, you know, buying land, selling land, whatever you want, or I'm using a census the date of whatever the event is that you're looking at, the records you have. And then I got the location. And let's see, will this move over so you can see? There, that's what it looks like. Don't move paper. <laughs> it moved again. Why is it doing that? Anyway, maybe I got to open the screen up bigger. So then the next box, I actually put in the live links if I have a document or I put an actual citation in there. But just remember, if you, this is in Word, you can put it in anything you want. You can add columns, take away columns, rows, whatever it is, and even the titles. I've got date, event, location, resource, and citations. Then I have informant or witness whoever is signing off on a document or that is a witness to a document included to a document your ancestor has. Then I have notes and questions and so what? So what is a way of analyzing? You're questioning the information and just basically saying, well, so what? It says my great, great grandfather did so and so, or he's in this location. What does that tell me? And then if there was other records I'm asking about, I want to make a list. Then I want to know what's the next steps to resolve whatever my questions are. And which you're now at the beginnings of building a research plan. And then you're going to tell yourself when you did it, completed it or not. So you're, you're basically building a timeline on the existence. So this one happens to be on Sarah Hart Goins and trying to determine who her parents are. So I'm tracking her because she was born in 1810. Somewhere in Virginia, all records just say VA. There's a live link that takes me to the 1820 census and it's telling me what was there and then my questions, and then what I told myself what I needed to do. Remember I said um, next steps, and which is building the research plan. So it's tell me, check Loudon, Berkeley, and Clark, uh, Clark counties, check Maryland counties, that's close to Jefferson. Need a note, you know, Sarah's race, because her race shows up at white. Another one, she's got mulatto, don't know. Uh, you know, trying to figure it out. I know she married a mulatto man, and um and then of course i don't have any completions because i use this as a training tool then i go to the you know she gets married there's an estimated time married there's my questions then the first child that was born the first child also died um within a couple years so these are the children here's a court case that i found and everything is running in chronological order or it should and you can see always make sure you put the resource there and there's the questions so this is just an example of how you can do it there's the columns that i use and it's worked well for me so far date event location resource citation informant witness my notes or my questions or so what meaning so what i've got a deed what does that mean go find a location a lot of times when i'm looking at census records and this is for anybody's brick wall i pay attention to who's in the neighborhood and the reason you do that is because if i'm in 1870 and then i go to 1880 I want to know if anybody else is there that was there in, in uh, the same neighborhood in 1870. And that's also a good tool 
when you're thinking about 1890 census, and we know that's supposedly missing, it was burned down, the whole fire and everything. Well, I'm not 100% sure you can't recreate or rebuild and answer the questionnaire of the information that was there. And I do a talk on that. Matter of fact, I've got one coming up. So for uh, Savannah Historical Society. But anyway, look at the questionnaire. Download the 1890 census questionnaire. That is every question that was going to be on the 18, that was on the 1890 census. And then between 1880 and 1900, 1910, answer those questions. You, you have documentation, you have location, so you got time and place. And learn what the columns were also on the 1890 census, even though you don't have it, you can download a blank form and you can download the questionnaire and start filling it in with the information you already had with the assumption that your ancestor is still in that area. Okay, so there's that timeline. You good? I think so. <laughs> okay, all right, I'll stop sharing. We checking the, the next one. <laughs> I'm uh, checking our participant list against the questions we have. Um, and so far, don't have any others that were pre-submitted from the audience. So I'm going to open it up. You know, it's well, I've got those two yep. that you sent me. Do you want me to answer those? Well, we'll start with one and then that'll give some time. Um, I'm going to say our participants, if you'd like to submit a question um, to get that either in the question answer or in the chat while Shelly is doing um, one of the other questions from the last session. And this is from Celia. She said, my great-grandmother left Charlottesville for, and I'm gonna pronounce it my way, because <laughs> it could be Bolivar, Boulevard, Bolivar. If you're up on Harper's Ferry, the little town area you ride through is Bolivar. Mm -hmm. If we're in Tennessee, it's Bolivar, but no. <laughs> I have a friend that lives in Bolivar, Tennessee. But anyway, she said they left Charlottesville for Bolivar, Tennessee with her parents at some point mid 19th century. So she's trying to determine, this is excellent, Celia, if you're here or not, but it's excellent the point that you break it out because that's another way that you're not creating your own brick wall is to be specific on what you're looking for and make it small and in smaller steps. So number one, the date of their move. She says, do I compare censuses from the both locations? You might not get down to the exact date, but you're going to be within a great range. Once people arrive, find, find the local church. If your folks were very religious, find out where the church is at. Find out if they're a school. You know, I know we're talking about the 1800s and I don't know what point in the 1800s, before the Civil War, after the Civil War. And I don't know if these are white or black folks and it really doesn't matter, but I raised that because the records you could look in is the Freedmen Bureau record. And it's called, you can find them on Family Search and it's the Bureau of Refugees and Freedmen and Abandoned Lands. And the reason I say that, because the refugees are white, the freedmen are the formerly enslaved, and of course the abandoned land folks would have been people that owned land prior to the Civil War and they left. So they're abandoned, abandoned lands. And again, uh, make sure you read the descriptive pamphlet on that so you know, understand what's in those records, because they are a gold mine. That is probably my favorite record set there is to look through besides pensions. And then try to find out if there was any labor contracts that were done. Freedmen Bureau records are 1865 to 1872. So the reason I say that is because the war ends and you got these field offices set up throughout the South. 
People would go get transportation funds, any type of assistance they needed, even down to rations if they were old, destitute, crippled, blind, whatever. And there should be a record. Labor contracts are done, especially with the former enslaved because a lot of times they actually had a labor contract right with their former slave owner. In other words, that means I'm gonna work for you and now you're gonna pay me, is basically how that comes out. Okay, so yes, compare the census and find out who else in the location they're in in Bolivar, Tennessee. Find out if there's anybody else coming from Virginia. That's all in that realm. And another thing, when I think of Bolivar, Tennessee, the Chickasaw Indians came into Bolivar, Bolivar from the Trail of Tears. Now that might be earlier than what you're thinking of. And a lot of those folks came out of Virginia and coming through um, and ended up in Tennessee. And um, a good place to check that out is to Google uh, and I'm gonna say the Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribes. That's Angela Walton Raji's expertise or Nika Sewell Smith on who is Nika Smith uh, website. She's part of the Chickasaw tribe. So she's got her card and Angela teaches and has done some podcasts on, um, you know, like Trail of Tears uh, and the Freedmen and things like that. So it might be some tips that you can pick up. Okay, and her second point was, the existence of a journal I heard exists that my great grandmother wrote about the journey, how it took six weeks to cross the Cumberland Plateau. I would Google that right there and find out who else has got the same kind of stories out there talking about crossing that Cumberland Plateau to go into Tennessee and attach yourself to the local public library there and also the historical society and just pay the whatever it is to join them and get on their mailing list. And then you have also as a member, you have access to have inquiries to say, do you have anything on this file? So on and so forth. Then her last I also, I would also recommend. Oh, uh, you're scrambled. Go ahead. Uh, and is, 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 is it better now? No, it's scrambled. Let me finish saying that. I'll let you do whatever you got to do. Um, and then her last point was the route they took maps and postcards and post the roads and things. Again, historical society number one. But you also want to look at the noted trail once you start Googling and finding books or articles about the trail, because people will write about the points where they stopped and something could have happened. So you can start rebuilding that trail. And again, that was Celia. And she's supposed to come. I don't think she's here. Um, I don't see her on the list. OK, go ahead, Miranda. And you put mapping, map, maps of us.org is in the chat room, which is an excellent yep. link. Yep. Yeah, maps of us.org. Yeah, uh -huh. you're still garbled. Oh, still. Yeah. And I don't know how to fix stuff like that. I have no technology. So I'm going to go to the next one that you emailed. <laughs> and this is from Earl. He thanks us. He enjoyed the last episode. He said, in my search, I have two well-known ancestors I'd like to learn more about. Also, these two ancestors introduced Native Americans into my bloodline, and they have a fascinating story. So he's read a lot of articles about them, and there's a part of an article, apparently he founded Harmon Station that is up around the Stanton, Virginia area. And the gentleman's name was Captain Thomas Maston, M as in Mary, A S, T as in Tom, I N. And they carry most of that Native American bloodline. Said he was at Fort Randolph, Port, uh, Point Pleasant, West Virginia. Remember, West Virginia became West Virginia June 9th, 
18, no, June 20, 1863. Anything prior to that, you need to be looking at the Library of Virginia. And when Chief Cornstalk and his son were killed, he adopted four Native American children after that skirmish, and there is records of the adoption. Okay, so he's talking about the children were getting married. There's also speculation that these men married women who were at least half Native American. As you can tell, there's lots of loose ends and I'm sure great possibility to know. Any advice would be appreciated. Again, I would deal with the history of these migrations of the Native American. Um, in Stanton, there's a historical society, but you also have the Daughters of the American Revolution chapter that's up there and find out if there's any research that they know of that they might have worked on with the historical society to see if there's any other stories and find out if there's any of those families still in the Stanton area and looking for uh, newspapers um, like newspaper.com, genealogy bank. Um, I would even check the archives.gov um, site also for stories regarding Harmon Station, uh, the things that happen in West Virginia. I do research in West Virginia, but up in the northern uh, eastern corner only. Um, but yeah, I think you've got some options there and find out what tribe that is and contact the tribe tribal office also to see if you can get some uh, more information. Let me see, Miranda, you there? Is it working now? Oh, no. <laughs> no. So I'm going to keep going. Let me, I'll check a message, you know, and you can, you can communicate with me there. Okay, so let's see. I see Karen. Okay, Lenora. The name John, F-A-H-L, does come up at the Statue of Liberty. Okay, Miranda mentioned that. Okay, Tracy, I am really just starting, but I've heard stories of how far back my family name goes, supposedly to Great Britain. I'm just looking to see if that's true. So is ancestry a good start if I know back to my great grandfather? Actually, I would go back to that wiki also. Ancestry also has the thing on origins of surnames. You got to just do it in their search box. But yes, it probably is Great Britain. A simple Google might resolve your questions and find out if, um, you know, what comes up when you're searching that last name. And I'm not sure if you're talking about Marshall or if you're talking about some other name. If it's Marshall, then we need to talk because I've got orange with origins with the last name Marshall and they do come out of England if I remember correctly which I can look up on my tree but yes ancestry is a good start but don't forget family searches wiki and I pulled that up you just pull up familysearch.org do the search drop down the menu and it says research wiki Okay, there's Miranda about the mats. Miranda, you may have to log out and come back in. Oh, that's a great idea. You got me as host, right? Miranda, I think you made me as host. So that means you can go and come back, I think, and I'll still be here. Okay, so I'm moving on down. Um, she's using her house Wi-Fi. Tracy, I don't know what Dudley. Oh, that's the last name is Dudley. I know that as first names. Okay. Yeah, I would Google. Um, I would Google. I actually have a great grand, great, great grand uncle. His name is Dudley Warden, W-O-R-D-E-N. And he comes out of England, Lancashire. But yeah, I would Google name origins and see what comes up and see if that helps. Is there any other questions coming up? Because if not, I'll go on to one of the ones that we didn't get to cover last 
last time we were on. Okay. Um, let's see. We got Charlottesville and the Trail of Tears, and we talked to Earl Smith. All right. So let me see. Did we answer this one? Okay. Veronica. I know this is not yours, but it's your last name is in part of this. So um, this question was, our surname is Moon, and on my mom's maternal side, and our ethnicity is African American with oral history of being Cherokee descent. I have gotten back in my research to John and Mary Moon, parents of Moses Moon and his 12 siblings. I have John Moon born about 1835, whose spouse was Mary Bowles, born about 1838. I will tell you from my experience, Moon and the Bowles, there's black and whites, okay? Um, I have found some possibilities on ancestry and have them on my family tree site. I use ancestry as cousin bait. I'm just letting you all know. My family tree maker software and Roots Magic genealogy software is where all my evidence-based proven lines are. But my ancestry tree is built with the brick walls and looking for more context and to find you know, maybe to resolve brick walls because we all have them. So that's my thought process on how I use the ancestry tree because you're saying you put what other people have on their tree, I think, or shared information on your tree. Remember, not everybody's going to research the way you do. So you want to always, if you're going to pull something from someone else's tree, Make sure there's documents that back it up. If not, leave it where it's at. Make a note, you know, and you can use the Ancestry site. Um, you have notes and comments right up there, you know, on your page and leave yourself notes and comments in there on saying, check this tree. It has the same people, you know, and put their name in. Okay, so coming back, um, Chris there is saying... Oral history, okay, I got that. Oral history states that at least one of them was enslaved. I can't find anything on them. I am aware that there was, there is and was a moon plantation in Albemarle, correct. And that's a high probability that may be where the info of these records exist. One side note, not all enslaved individuals took the slave owner's surname. Very few. So it's a good thing if they did because it helps on the research. Now, what you want to do is find out anything on the Moon family. And that means probates, wills, uh, chancery records, Library of Virginia, you can look at chancery records. Um, of course, do your normal genealogy search on family search and also on ancestry for the moon. Moon is quite a large name in Albemarle. And um, yes, things happen with Mr. Flecker, Dr. Walter Flecker. And um, he just made everybody, I guess, black. And that was through the 20s and 30s. So I would work around that and not worry about that and start just follow what you can pull documentation from and uh yes on the virginia uh uva site about the monican indians and things it talks about some other than this historical document i found little to no documentation uh, although i found the surname moon moon is a common name in every Indian tribe I know of because there's a spiritual aspect to it just like you noted and I'm, I'm speaking to the person that wrote this um, Cherokee Choctaw and Chickasaws and they're on the Dawes Rose and so and actually the person that wrote this is Tanash and so Tanash this is for you 
again, I would try to focus on the location and track the white family. And I'm talking about that plantation owner. Because yes, maybe some of the enslaved took the moon name, which I know they did because I know some moons. And also the fact is you have to realize that that plantation is where the records are. So you have to research the white side in order to get your black side. And it uh, looks like Lenora posted uh, a site, Albemarle County in Virginia by Reverend Edgar Woods, page 281, talks about the moons. The Albemarle Charlottesville Historical Society has a moon family file, which somebody would have contributed items to it. And so you want to make contact. The um, Historical Society is by appointment only, and you're required to wear a mask. And you e email library at, was it, albemarlehistory.org. And if I'm incorrect, Miranda's going to put that in the chat. Oh, wait, you sounded clear. Say that again. Yes. Yes. No, you're perfect. And I see you talked about the moon's own Viewmont and Mount Air. And then there's so, yep. Okay, so that was two that we got through. And let me see. Um, this other one was talking about um This next one we had, it, unless there's a new, somebody posted some question there. Thank you, Lenora, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, so one of the other ones that we didn't get to last time we met was from Prentice. She said, I would like the following question answered during the virtual event. I don't remember us answering this. She says, I can't find any records on my maternal great grandparents. On my grandmother's marriage certificate, she has Melinda Liggins, L-I-G-G-O-N-S, and William Johnson as her parents. On her death certificate, she has Maggie Green and William Johnson. Beyond these names, I have been unable to find anything on them. Any suggestions how to find more brick wall here. Also noted that my fourth great grandmother married an Indian named Sarah. How could I find out more information on Sarah's maiden name and what tribe she is from? Okay, so let's address the thing about Melinda Liggins and Maggie Green. A lot of times Maggie and Melinda and Elizabeth are the same person. So Maggie could be a version of Melinda, just like it is Margaret. So don't discount that. And if I see two different names, I think there is either a married maiden name, a maiden name, which that surname like Green could come from one of her parents or grandparents, or she was married and um, there's another marriage in between. You're going to have to resolve that issue first. And again, I would bring back up the timeline and try to get that in chronological order and find out, well, where's William Johnson? Did he die? Did she have a chance to marry again? Or was she married to a green first and then she marries William Johnson? And um, so I think there's just a little more digging there um, and be open that there could be another marriage or 
find out if Green is another surname in her family line. Miranda, any other suggestions you can think of? You're on mute. There you go. Yeah. Also, regarding ligands, yes, that is one of the names that is tied that I know of to uh, Indian uh, surname. Um, because one of the instructors at that Genealogy Institute, um, Terry Liggins is an expert in, in, and it's either Chickasaw or Cherokee, and I don't remember which one, but he is a Liggins and his expertise, in, and I talked about it earlier, the freedmen of the five civilized tribes. So that Liggins line, there was a slave owner, Liggins, that enslaved African Americans and Liggins was the, I believe the Native American was the Liggins that enslaved African Americans. So I would Google Liggins and um, I don't know where this is rooting out. If it's any of the path of the Trail of Tears before they get to Indian territory and become, before it becomes Oklahoma or go right to the Dawes Rose and things that are on like Family Search, Ancestry, and start researching, um, well, hit the 1910 census first, and then back your way back up. Again, the wiki on Family Search, bless you, Melinda. <laughs> the wiki on Family Search is another good um, place to start looking at that. And Google Freedmen of the Five Civilized Tribe. I don't know if we're talking about white or black, but it doesn't matter because you're talking about now about trying to find out where this connects to a tribe and was this tribe anywhere in the area where your ancestors were at. Okay. I have plenty, Miranda. <laughs> Which book was that? Uh, she does talks. Do Google Angela Walton hyphen Raji, R-A-J-I. They can listen to her talking. Uh, I know she's on blog talk radio research at research at the National Archives and Beyond with Bernice Bennett. They can Google and listen to her talk. She's one of the leading experts in the country on the five civilized tribes in the freedmen. And there's, um, and she teaches a whole track on this. And you're, because one of the record sets I remember her talking about the other day has 14,000 names in there. And, and I just thought, okay, I want Native American. You know, I want mine to be, to be connected because to find the records. She actually has two books. For one reason, I think her volume one is in our library. Um, I think I donated. Number two is out now. I got to get, I'll order and donate that. Um, part two is there. Um, she just, that came out a couple months ago, part two. And matter of fact, the publisher is the local publisher here. Angela is in Maryland. Jean Cooper is a librarian at Altman, and she has short press publishing. Yes, and then there's volume two as well. And she is going through, and you're seeing the questionnaires that everybody had to answer when they're, you know, coming into the tribe, and there was just so much information on these cards and the answers on the questionnaires. So if you are a person of color and you think you had, you know, attached to some Indian tribe, I would definitely check, um, check out Angela's work. Um, and Blog Talk Radio, the name of it is Research at the National Archives and Beyond, and Bernice Bennett, and then you can search for Angela's name, 
and uh, the talks that she's given on that, even about her books is not that long ago, within the last couple months when the second book came out, she just did an interview. Very fascinating, very interesting. And I'm sitting here thinking, I know both of my books are in my bookcase, um, which I'm transitioning, putting all my Virginia stuff all in a separate bookcase. So they're not in their normal order because I should be able to look right at it. And she has came here and talked, but she has not talked on the Native Americans. And of course, Virginia has their Native Americans as well. But Angela can get you back Trail of Tears all the way through to Indian Territory to Oklahoma in present day. Her, um, it's interesting because when she's on Zoom or whatever, the picture of her great grandmother is behind her who was Choctaw and um, African American. Yeah, yeah, that's Miss Sally. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right, let's go to a next one. So if you've got questions, you got to ask these. If not, we're going to keep going the way we're going. The parents are Melinda Liggins and William Johnson. So are you, go ahead. Okay, I'm not seeing that. I see your parents, but I don't see any links there. Oh, I see, I see. So you found the marriage of them. But wasn't Melinda also um, the Maggie Green? If I remember correctly. So, so clarify your question if I'm not answering it. The marriage, okay, now I'm confused. Okay, the parents, the parents of their daughter, no, Melinda Liggins and, okay, but what about her daughter, Lenora? That doesn't go with what you wrote. You said on my great, on my grandmother's marriage certificate, she has Melinda Liggins and William Johnson's on her parents as her parents and then on her death certificate she has maggie green and william johnson so we're talking about her parents still and i'm saying that maggie could have had another marriage or that maggie the green could be a surname of maggie's ancestry someone in her line and find out if green is another surname could have been her grandmother's i'm i'm shelly viola viola is my grandmother on my dad's side's name sometimes people use the surname as a middle name and um, a lot of times and i've seen this in enslaved narratives or in some records that middle name was a surname or a former owner that could link to where family people were at Okay. All right. Let me see who was the next one. Okay. So this one was Carol from Caroline. And is she on here? No. She says, I'm doing research in time around the revolution. My favorite war. I have two mysteries. One, William Beck. I have service for, but can't connect him to wife or family. So oral history is all she has there. The second is Gideon Carr, who I have everything for, but I can't find revolutionary service for his age. His age would likely have him paying a supply tax or given supplies. His wife, son, and son-in-law are already proven DAR patriots. Are there any off-the-grid resources for this area? 
and for these families? Where might they be and who do I contact? So let me make sure I understand what she's asking. So I have two mysteries. William Beck. I have service for, but I can't connect him to wife or family. So all she has is oral history. So number one, how do you know he's married? And number two, I think the only route if he was married was finding a death certificate for children, for, for any of their children, if they had children, where it would name uh, the parents. So you could do a search and just put, like on Ancestry, just put the parents uh, or, or the father, I'm going to say it this way, go in the death section and only fill out the part for father and and you're going to have to have a location and just see if any death records come up with William Beck being the father. Okay? Or put William Beck in just him. Yeah, just put William Beck in and don't click none of the exacts or anything or do it and undo it and see the findings that you have. But I think you're going to need to put a location in here. Some off the grid records typically around Civil War is going to be battles, battle information, scrimmages. So if you know what group they might have been with, or the battles or, or the regiments or whatever that was in the area where your ancestor was at possibly or that state and start doing the research on the units. I'm saying units, but that sounds like civil war, but regiments, all of that, you know, and start going for their unit in their names, their records, and things like that and see if you can find something. Find out if that person got a pension. Pension could give some details. Find out the other Revolutionary War folks, wherever he died at. Find out if there's any other patriots in that same county because sometimes they're not far from each other. And I'm going to say that, and I'm going to use the example of Arnold Warden. He's born in New London, Connecticut. Uh, Steery, um, I'm going blank on his last name. Um, anyway, a neighbor to Arnold also was in the Revolutionary War. They're born in New London, Connecticut got their pensions, right? But when they get out of the service, when they're done after the Revolutionary War, they both end up in Rensselaer County, New York. They were not only one time during the pension was I able to connect them being together at the same time, you know, during the war. But then they end up going to Rensselaer County, New York in the town of Petersburg. And I say that so now I can research Rensselaer County and find out how many more Patriots were also there. Did they all root out of New London, Connecticut? So you're kind of piecing it together because if you can find some of their stories and information, you might find out something on your ancestor. So that's one example. Then you said the second one is Gideon Carr. And then other people in the family are already proven patriots. So what, she can't find anything on Gideon Carr's service. Find out if Gideon is a middle name um, for one. And of course in Albemarle County, the Carr family is very big. And the Carr family also links back to Thomas Jefferson. And I want to say, um, is it Dabney Carr was friends with Thomas Jefferson? And for some reason, I think he's buried out there, Dabney Carr at Monticello or something. There's something with the Carr family. Then there's the Black Carr family, Ivy Creek. 
and um, that. So there's a website for that, and it's Ivy Creek Foundation, I think it is, in Charlottesville. So, and see if this same car, because I don't know location, so I can't address if it's Albemarle, Charlottesville area. But so again, off the grid resources would find that Ivy Creek, find out if Gideon Carr is any of the names, check the library, uh, I'm sorry, not Library of Virginia, the virginia.edu site, um, and uh, Encyclopedia of Virginia is another site, and you can check there. Again, the Carr family, if you're talking about Albemarle County, Charlottesville, they're huge. Now, another way of finding out, because with DAR, one of the things that you would have to prove is residency. So if you have the, um, you know, where they were living at, the ones that are proven that are family members, you want to find out if, if um, that William Beck or that Gideon Carr is also in that same area where the ones that are proven. Because what do we have, six, eight years? Uh, really, the war didn't end 1776, but you know, stuff was still going on. And also check out, and again, I don't know what state we're talking about, but the militia groups. Because everybody after the war typically served in the militia group, and I think it was a requirement so that might be another off the grid place to look at and find out. I would go to um, not your National Archives, but again, like a Library of Virginia. And thank you, Francis. Yes, Dabney Carr lived at Monticello and was Jefferson's secretary. Yeah. And again, this Gideon could be a first name, could be a middle name. But um, I think looking at the other stuff that's already proven and finding out the time frame, if, if Gideon would be around the same area. And check Encyclopedia Virginia. And I don't know the, the URL, but I know it's Encyclopedia. Um, and Francis says, yes, Dabney Cott, yeah. It is, I think, Ivy Creek National Area Foundation with the Greers followed there. Yes, definitely. I'm looking for a slave girl of the sister and brother-in-law of Benjamin Watkins. Is, um, okay, is Benjamin Watkins the slave owner? I want to make sure I get this right. The slave girl of the sister and brother-in-law of Benjamin Watkins. Also the two boys he had with her. Okay, clarify that for me, Francis. Um, the slave girl of the sister and brother-in-law, because uh, it sounds to me like Benjamin Watkins is the slave owner. He has a slave girl and she's got a sister and a brother-in-law also enslaved by Benjamin Watkins. And then the two boys he had with her. So then there's two other boys. He recorded his will in the courthouse. He was able to He's buying her freedom. So he's not the slave owner then. Uh, 
Okay, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not clear. I'm not. Okay. So he buys her in 1819. Did she clarify it? Because I'm lost. <laughs> So Benjamin buys her from his brother-in-law who owned her. Okay, so you're trying to find out who she is? Is that the bottom line clear cut? Who is the slave girl? Yes. Okay. Let me put a different hat on. <laughs> so my first question would be, and again, if I mess this up, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. We might need to get on the phone to get through this one. Um, so the brother-in-law that owned her before Benjamin Watkins buys her in 1819, First, I would ask, and I'm going to assume that you have this, but information of her being enslaved there. She's on an inventory list or something, and she gets sold. So now she's at his house. And apparently, you don't have a name for her unless it's on the bill of sale when he buys her. And... Do you have her name? Well, we're just waiting for her to respond. No, she doesn't have her name. So the bill of sale basically was a girl aged so-and-so for X dollars. It sounds like that's what you have. So you're trying to determine. So do you know of anything later on about her or any of the females that were enslaved at Benjamin Watkins place in, um, were they at Henrikeville? It's no, 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 no. So 1850, 1860, and again, I don't know what time frame. Let's see, he's buying her in 1819. So she could be any age, unless you're researching that brother-in-law's papers, and he makes mention of him selling her, or in any narrative. And you're not talking about Edgefield, South Carolina, are you? Is there an Edgefield, Virginia? Because the Edgefield, um, North Carolina is huge. So what, tell me what county this Edgefield is in. Not South Carolina. Okay, so you're talking about something in Virginia. So I still would have to find out from the brother-in-law what records they have on the girl babies there. And again, 1819, so they're not going to make the slave index and um, the Virginia Slave Birth Index, which is another resource, but it's later, not addressing her time. The Virginia Slave Birth Index, also there's copies at the, his, the Historical Society, but they're also online on Family Search, and they are an index from 1853 to 1865. And what that is, is the slave owner uh, the mother of the baby born and the baby born, slave baby born, and uh, what county, the date in the county. And again, there's a picture of what they look like. There's six, actually five volumes and then a supplement, but it's during this time. I think for, for me, I would work back with who owned her first. And uh, then come forward, yes. 
Oh, she's saying it's after this time? Uh, don't know what after this time means because he buys her in 1819. We don't have an age unless the bill of sale says something about the age. Coming forward, you have to find out when his inventory increases because he purchased another slave. Was there any other slaves purchased about the same time the slave girl was purchased? Okay, your book is after this time, correct. Okay, so again, okay. Right. Francis, have you seen that? Yeah. Francis, yeah. Yes. Okay, good. And and again, the whole arco, uh, one of the things if you have had, well, now she says no. So I'm not sure. But either way, the references, if you have access to JSTOR, is to find out the resources. Great. If not, if you, I actually can log. That might, that might help, won't it? There we go. There you go. Now your co-host. For Jay, there it is. So, Francis, have you seen this article or not? Because you got a yes and a no, and I don't know which one you're answering. And J store is J S as in Sam T O R. So, have you accessed this article? I don't know if she's. Okay, well, we're, she's not answering right now. Um, because the goal to getting to this article, if you have not seen it, would be that you want to see, but will you please email me and, and remind me about this in that article? And um, and I want to talk a little further with you about that article because the resources or whatever they use to write that article might have some information on there. I don't know if it's going to get you down to the girl or whoever it was that wrote the article, but um, 
you got the name of the article, find out also if it's on any other database besides JSTOR. And I don't know if you work, not work, or whatever, but if you're associated with the university, you typically have access to JSTOR, where you can download the whole article. Correct, but I think you have to be there. You can, you can put your card number on. I don't know where she's from to know if she has a Library of Virginia card. And you know, they changed something uh, last year. We all either got new numbers or something changed with the library card and I can't remember what it is. Okay, you got it. She can do UVA. Great. Because that's what I was going to connect with you because you could look at JSTOR. I'm, you know, look at the articles and things. So good luck on that. All right, how are we doing on time? Okay, that's great. I hope this is being helpful. You know, um, just let us know. Um, there was a question, uh, but some of it got cut off. And we talked about Thomas Duke. I think, but yeah, we talked about Thomas Duke. Okay, this one was interesting. And it was by a Karen and not the Karen that was here. Um, it's by a different Karen. And Miranda, you sent this one over. And it says, I have been able, unable to locate any documents indicating my name except for one document. That was his social security. Oh, it's cut off. Social Security who raised them. Um, I don't have this, it, it, it cut off. So I, I don't want to answer that because I'm probably missing something critical. Um, oh, do you have it? Okay, good, go for it. Wow, that's a loaded one because number one, I don't know what state we're referencing. I don't know if she's in Virginia or California. California, their adoption stuff, you can, the index, the birth records, they're online. And um, so you could pull that up. I have, um, which was real interesting. I had received an email and with a DNA match. Um, and the lady was seeking her birth parents' names. And she had been through five different adoptions and, and so on and so forth. But her name never changed from when she was adopted. And so hers was California. So we were able to back in, find the record, which gave her mother's full name and um, the area and the family was still in that same area today. And so it was, I, I handed it to her and said, it's up to you now, if you wanna pursue this further, here's your mother, birth mother's name, this, that, and the other. So depending on what state you're in, you wanna know 
if there was any adoption that actually happened. And number two, I would back into looking for divorces and not marriages. Just look for a different record set. You know, um, it's still going to be in the counties and things. And then I would also look for, you know, just putting the, the two last names in and not first names in on the search. Um, and again, ancestry and also family search. Don't click anything exact because I think you lose sometimes or you do it and undo it. And just put the two surnames and look for marriages that way and not first names. And then if the first names, um, because your last name, if it's the same as her last name, she needs to make that one word or just use the second part, the grasso, as the name. And maybe the Dell is a middle name, you know, and start researching differently, you know, flipping it around. That would be the suggestions I would try. I would research that name too. Ancestry has a part on there on origin uh, names and see the various spellings because I think most of that what you're missing is probably going to have to do with something that would be a uh, misspelling, which is very common. My Goins family, which is G-O-E-N-S, G-O-I-N-S, G-O-I-N-G-S, G-O-W, so on. I have 12 different spellings of the Goins family. And again, we're talking about how it's heard and the literacy factor on the numerator or whoever it is that took the information. So I would back in and research that Del Grasso, because, you know, that could be Dutch. That could be all kind of things, you know, and see if you can find the origins of it. And also find out if anybody, uh, say if you got a census record and find out who else is in that neighborhood that might have the same roots as the person you're looking for. Okay. All right, that was that. I think we're about done. There was a... Yeah, there was a question about Bibles. Did we talk about that last week? Because if not, I just want to make a couple comments on that and then we can end from that. Okay. Well, yeah, somebody, Elizabeth, had shared that she had uh, huge family Bibles, you know, and she scanned a lot of it. I would contact Family Search. And depending on the time frame, DAR is another place to contact. But family search and ancestry too. Um, you know, uh, the church typically would have people probably not far from wherever you live because of the family history centers that are in a lot of communities. And I know we're going through tough times with COVID and things like that. But yeah, I wouldn't throw them out either. I would donate them. And that would be to the local historical society. And again, what age uh, era are you speaking of and things like that. So that would be my comment. Don't, don't dump them, call Family Search. And if you don't have a contact there, let me know. You know, just post that question back to us and I will give you some emails. Okay, perfect. Yes, yes. And thank you for coming. We appreciate this. And Friday, if anybody wants to join on Freedman Bureau Records, 
Uh, definitely. Oh, yes. Yes. The Gap. Generations of Albemarle Project. The Albemarle Sharpsville Historical Society has uh, developed a program talking about generations of families in the area. So it's Charlottesville, Albemarle. And what this is, um, individuals or families can submit their generations or their lineage and um, back to as far, as far as they can go back into Albemarle, Charlottesville, um, ascend, um, I'm sorry, ancestors. And what the program is goal is to one, build, build files on the earlier families that were in the area, uh, you know, during different times. How far can you go back? How many generations? Can you go back five generations? Can you go back six or whatever it is? Albemarle County was formed in 1744, I think, and Charlottesville became the um, county seat. So this is a way to recognize your ancestors and your lineage to this area, Charlottesville, Albemarle County, and you'll be able to get a Generations of Albemarle Certificate by the Historical Society, and your name will go in a list you know, so people or other descendants and families will also have access to be able to have this genealogy information. So we're excited about it. Uh, you also get a, a year membership with the Historical Society as well. But it's time to tell those stories and, and get your ancestors' names up on the list. So that was it. I got to age 27. <laughs> Good All luck, right. Tracy. I see your comment. I start digging. <laughs> All righty. And All again, right. if you want Freedmanville record, seven o'clock on Friday, but you have to go to Facebook and uh, to get the link. Finding enslaved laborers at UVA is the Facebook page. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and have a great evening.